morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Luke 3, 7 to 18. And it says, John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what shall we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what shall we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you heard the good news John the Baptist was talking about? The ministry of John the Baptist fulfills Isaiah's prophecy of the voice crying in the wilderness. Some people wanted to be baptized by John so they could escape <clears throat> eternal punishment. <clears throat> but they weren't repenting from sin. They weren't willing to change their way of living. They really had not heard the good news. John had harsh words for such people. <clears throat> he knew that God values reformation above ritual and that confession of sins and a changed life are inseparable. Faith without deeds is dead. Following Jesus means more than saying the right words. It means acting on what he said. Many of John's hearers were shocked when he said that being Abraham's descendants wasn't enough to ensure salvation. The religious leaders relied on their family lying more than their faith to their standing with God. For them, religion was inherited. But a personal relationship with God can't be handed down from parents to children. Everyone has to commit to it on his or her own. Don't rely on someone else's faith for your salvation. Some people feel that if someone else is praying for them, that's good enough. But that's not what's needed. You have to believe. You have to make your own choice to follow Jesus. Have you made that personal decision to trust Christ? John's message demanded at least three responses. Share what you have with those who need. Whatever your job is, do it well and with fairness. And be content with what you're earning. That last one's kind of hard for a lot of people, isn't it? John didn't have time to address comforting messages for those who live carelessly and selfish lives. He was calling people to right living as he prepared the way for their Messiah. John's message is still important to us today. What changes can you make in sharing what you have and doing your work honestly and well and being content with what you have? Israel hadn't seen a prophet in over 400 years. And it was widely believed that when the Messiah would come, prophecy would reappear. So when John came on the scene, the people were excited. He was obviously a great prophet. And they were sure that the time for the long-awaited Messiah had come. Some even thought John was the Messiah. 
John spoke like the prophets of old. Turn away from your sin to avoid punishment. Turn towards God to experience his mercy and his approval. It's a message for all time and all places. But John spoke it with urgency because he was preparing the way for the Messiah. John's message was geared to the people who came to hear him, to the curious and presumptuous and complacent. He preached a message of warning and repentance to those who repented and wanted to know what to do. He gave them practical advice to show the fruits of repentance. To those looking for the Messiah, he pointed away from himself, the one who was mightier than he. We still have those three groups today, and John's message is still geared to them. Which groups do you fit in? John the Baptist always had faithful preaching, Christ-focused ministry, and boldness in the face of opposition. John calls the people to repentance and a life of righteousness. He makes it clear that he isn't the Messiah whose sandals I'm an other, unworthy to untie, telling them even greater things will be seen when the Messiah comes. John spoke of joy, the same joy we celebrate every Christmas. Christmas isn't a really about seasonal joy, though. It isn't about extravagant commercial excesses either. At its best, it's a reminder of the joy that is ours always. A shot in the arm to our flagging spirit, or a kick in the pants to our bored complacency. At least it would be a kick in the pants if John had his way. John was a pants kicker from the start. He did a high kick in Elizabeth's womb when he heard Mary's voice through the waters in which he swam. And he came out kicking, I'm sure. He kicked himself out of the house as soon as it was possible. He kicked it out in the desert, kicked over beehives to get to the wild honey, kicked a tree full of locusts for snacks to munch on, while he wandered around shouting at rocks and stones. He kicked a camel's carcass for a coat to wear. <coughs> then he decided it was time to kick some sense into the people of God down by the riverside. I don't know about you, but I always smile a little bit at verse 18 that says, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. What more exhortations? What else could he say? What else could he kick? What good news? Some of the things he said didn't sound like good news to me. The sounds were oppressive, finger-pointing, and name-calling. So how in the world can we say he proclaimed the good news? But he did. That's the problem with good news. Sometimes things got to change first before you can get to that good news. It's good news if you're willing to change for it, if you're willing to do your part. John understood that. John majored in that. So he let them have it. He poured it over them like water and splashed it into their faces shouting at them to wake up. He asked them to question their own motives. What brings you here? You snakelets still sucking on your egg tooth used to crack your way out of your shell? Still wet behind the ears, if snakes have ears. You don't know what you're doing, mostly because you're not doing anything. The only thing you're doing is looking out for yourself. You think you're special, but you're like rocks in my shoes. Stones I stub my toe on. Grass cuttings you leave to be picked up with the garbage. Whoa, chill out, John. Actually, they didn't tell him to chill. They asked him in panic. What then should we do? And they panicked because they were afraid he was going to say, you're out of luck, cuckoo. Bend down and kiss the grass goodbye. But he didn't snarl or sneer didn't tell them it was too late. He told them what they needed to change, what to look forward to. He answered in a way that made sense, and groups of them came forward. The tax collectors and soldiers asked him, athletes and film stars, politicians and truck drivers, 
biker gangs and refugees. They all came and warned us, or dozens had asked them, what then shall we do? John had the answer, he knew. What would you tell these people? John told them, bear fruit. Bear as in carry, as in show, as in live. That was his answer, live. What should we do? Live, but live rightly. Live, he told the soldiers, for justice. Don't abuse your power. Don't threaten to get your way to scare our quarters. And we're in contentment. For heaven's sake, we're in contentment. Don't keep wanting more and more and more. To the tax collectors called by some the enemy of the people, he said, live for mercy. Don't take more than the people can stand, more than you're supposed to take. Don't rob, don't steal, don't wound with the stroke of your red pen. Care about the people over whom you have authority. To the crowd, thronging the banks of the water, he said, live. Live in generosity. Live in community. Live as though you belong to one another, because you do. <clears throat> live as though you're responsible for one another, because you are. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Worthy, as in earning it. So if I do right, I get what I deserve? No. No. A thousand times, no. Bear fruit because you've repented because you've turned around and are now walking a new direction, because you know this new life and want to share it, because this life you claim, this joy from which you have drunk, isn't meant to be kept inside. It's not meant to be kept quiet. You've got to share it. You've got to <coughs> shout it. You've got to sing it. You've got to let everyone know your life has changed because of the good news that John proclaimed. That's how we share the good news. That's our job. 